Grades and marks may be the tradi traditional gauge of how well a student is learning, but has that supposed importance reached its peak as we educate and the way we do it continues to evolve? Ticker Ed starts right now. Ticker Ed, in association with Enquiry Tracker, empowering schools to manage and grow inquiries and online enrolments. Hello and welcome back to Ticker Ed, where we will be unpacking and examining the way we teach, listen and learn from primary education through to university and beyond. Ticker Ed is of course backed by the Inquiry Tracker team, who are the all-in-one solution for schools to easily manage their future families. And of course, whilst Inquiry Tracker is the presenting sponsor of today's program, all of the opinions and statements expressed in the following shows are of course our own. And joining me now is my regular co-host and founder of Inquiry Tracker, Greg Campitelli. Greg, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Awesome. So today's topic looks to cover our session with exam results and grades that students get pretty much at most levels of education mm -hmm. uh, as we move up the education levels into secondary and tertiary as well. It does seem to become very marks focused, doesn't it? I certainly remember my year 12 exams, Greg, oh. uh, being extremely stressful. Extremely stressful. Who can forget? I mean, I've had uh, four children go through it myself and the anxiety and the stress levels are uh, 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 as they sit those examinations and then wait for those results that are going to determine what university they get to can be a bit unhealthy and a bit unholy. And it really uh, starts very young, even in mm. elementary schools, we're seeing sort of grading and assessing, almost replacing the learning outcomes that are important. It gets really exacerbated at high school when we're in that pointy end uh, uh, stakes game determining what university you're going to get into or what university you're not going to get into can be you know, ridden with that anxiety. Um, and this continues at university at the tertiary level with the, 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 the great uh, grade point average, you know, uh, dominating uh, all your thinking and, and your, your, how you're reacting. What I think is starting to happen is that the mark has gone from being an outcome or a measure mm. to potentially an end goal in itself. Um, and the learning and feedback that you might be getting from the teacher has become of secondary importance. Okay, but you were a teacher at one point in time. Tell yes. us a little bit about your experience when it came to grading. Was it uh, difficult to I stamp a red F on somebody's paper? I, absolutely, I found it one of the most difficult things yeah. to do. And the emergence of uh, marking rubrics has really helped in the grading assessment for teachers. But that F you talked about, how do you fail at learning? You, you know, re how can you fail at learning? You're not, you're not learning well enough. Mm. You can't fail at learning. That's just not, not, not right. But don't we have to have marks just to jump in there? Don't they ensure the standards are uh, being up, you know, updated and parents are getting what they pay for? I and, and it's reasonable to say that because in some ways, yes, it's easy to cut marks and examinations are an easy way to categorize a large group of people. And it must be said that running a large scale examination is a very cost effective way of uh, assessing people in the mm. admissions process. You know, you do an exam, you give them a grade, you ca classify them and bang, you're in, you're out. Yeah. You know, so it, it, but it feels very much like that the mark and the grade is dominating the outcome. The tail is now starting to wag the dog. Interesting, mm. okay, so what is that focus, I guess, or obsession resulted in? What have we ended up with in terms of, you know? Well, a bit of an unhealthy dependency on marks and grading, yeah. you know, like, you, uh, and perhaps if I just make four points before we bring in our expert guest, it's a crude form of feedback. You know, you get a letter or a number and anything else in the feedback seems to fall on deaf ears. Like when your kids come home, what grade did you get? Mm. Not how did you perform in the exam? It's all one answer. Um, the other part is the a tendency in the system to favor recall. You know, what you can remember oh, yeah. rather than what you know and how you apply your learning. And the other thing is that this fear of risk taking. Uh, sir, is that question going to be on the exam? Ah, uh, yes. If it's not on the exam, I won't learn it. 100%. You know, and finally, perhaps the, the last point I'll make is this obsession with in grades can lead to a riddled anxiety based system. You think of China, Japan, Korea, this this obsession on the mark, the obsession on the grade, yeah. at the cost of everything else, at the high cost of mental health and anxiety, mm. and, and in some case, tragedy. And we're seeing a dependency that can start cultivating systems as cheating, uh, uh, buying papers, cram schools. Oof. Cram schools are schools you go to after school. Wow. Not to mention people abusing certain substances to stay up more and work harder and... Absolutely, you know. so that whole mental health thing. So what's happened is this exciting new phenomena, mm. which is really interesting, is this, this a phenomenon called ungrading. 
Okay. which is a perfect opportunity to bring in our guest. Let's do it. All right. So joining us now from the USA is Jesse Stommel, who is a faculty member in the writing program at the University of Denver and executive director of Hybrid Pedagogy. And he's here to tell us all about the process of ungrading. Good to see you, Jesse. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, it's super nice to see you. Um, yeah, I look forward to chatting with you all. Well, let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. And I guess about this uh, hybrid pedagogy. Am I saying that correctly? You are saying it. Actually, I mean, there's multiple different pr pronunciations of the word. Uh, sometimes I look at my bio and my bio has the word pedagogy in it several times. And I listen to people read my bio and they have to stumble over the word. It's interesting that I keep using the word. Sometimes people push back on the use of the word pedagogy because it suggests something that um, so, something that can feel a bit alienating to people. But the reason that I continue to use the word is because I think there's something unique about this word. There's something it's trying to communicate. It's essentially the intersection between the philosophies and the practices of teaching. So it isn't just teaching as a set of behaviors or a set of activities we do, but is instead the philosophies and approach that we take to teaching and then how that gets inflected in our practice. Jesse, tell us all about ungrading and this movement and this phenomenon that's starting to sweep and create interest around the world. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've been doing uh, research on pedagogy and research on assessment and grades for much of my career. I've been teaching for 22 years and I have been doing a version of ungrading for the entirety of my teaching career. I have never put a grade on a single piece of student work. It doesn't mean that I don't have to put final grades at the end of the term at all of the institutions I've worked, multiple states, and also most of the countries that I've collaborated with over the years, that final grade is still required by most institutions. So for me, what ungrading is, it, it, it's a couple things. It is raising our eyebrows at grades as a system. It is wondering at, asking hard questions, analyzing and rethinking grades. But to me, the most important piece of that is to do that work together with students so that we're asking students to take a critical look at their own education and really giving uh, sort of giving that kind of authority that I think that systems of grades take away from students back to them so that they can think about their own learning in critical, thoughtful ways. And they aren't just worried about extrinsic marks. Absolutely. Jesse, where were you when I was going through school? I was one of those students who just, it was so stressful and horrifying to go through. But uh, how can we gauge students learning in lieu of grades, do you think? Once we sort of remove that mar uh, mark, so to speak, um, what's the other option? What's the, the, you know, the gauge? I think it comes back to a question of who grades are for. Uh, so who is the audience for grades? And you named during the intro to this um, conversation, you named a number of them. Parents, uh, accrediting boards, when someone's an undergraduate, their future graduate schools, when someone is in primary school, college entrance, uh, when they're at the point of getting some kind of licensure for particular professional organizations, grades become important at those moments, potentially also future employers. You might even also think of grades as important as students move from one course to the next level of the course. So from something like biology 101 to biology 102 in order to, as you say, gauge how they're doing. But I think that the deeper question is to ask, well, is that the primary audience for grade it, grades? Is that who we're really trying to communicate to? And I think the answer is no. I think ultimately what we really want to do is support student learning. And that means using grades or any form of assessment to communicate with students about where they're at and how they're doing. And honestly, I would say the best way to do that is to have conversations with students, to ask them, how are you doing? What are you struggling with? What barriers do you face? So that doesn't mean we necessarily push all those other audiences to the side, but we recognize that students should be the primary audience for grades or any kind of assessment we do. And then that necessarily changes how that assessment works. That's so true, Jesse. I often find as a, uh, when we try to write reports or uh, give assessments for parents as the, perhaps the, the secondary audience in the, in the grading experience, they're often looking for that grade. They want to judge rather than perhaps have the deeper, more meaningful conversation, don't you think, about how their student is performing or their child is performing? Yeah, and I mean, the thing is learning is hard. And when, and, and the re developing 
successful relationships between students, between students and teachers is complicated. And I think one of the things that grades do, uh, traditional grades, standardized grades, standardized assessments, one of the things that they do really successfully is pit students and teachers against one another. And they also pit students against each other. So the kind of collaborative learning environment that we're trying to create, and ultimately the kind of space where students can sort of really challenge themselves and pushes, push themselves, ends up getting obstructed by grades more than supported by them. That's so true, absolutely. So how might schools implement this process, do you think, just to finish up? Yeah, well, I think that we start by having conversations. And really that means asking students, when do you learn? How do you learn? Why are you here? What barriers do you face? And this means asking hard questions about who our students are. Are our students food insecure? Are they housing insecure? Are they from marginalized communities? Are they disabled? How does that impact their learning? The thing is grades attempt to flatten students, imagining that we can neatly compare students to one another. And instead asking ourselves, can we create assessment approaches that recognize that each student is different, each class is different, each discipline is different, each teacher is different. And that means throwing out some of the assumptions that we've made about grades and assessment. Absolutely well said by you, Jesse. Thank you so much for joining us on the program to highlight more about this space. And again, I wish this process was around when I was going through school. It would have saved a lot of uh, time and bother, I think. Thank you. And Greg, of course, thank you to you. Thought-provoking show as always. Uh, you get great, such great guests. It's great. I was just thinking about what Jesse was saying there. And a lot of the teachers grade on this bell curve. You know, you've got to have a certain number of students getting that mark, a certain number of students getting that mark, a certain number of students getting that mark, and down. And that, that dominates the Australian education system mm. and dominates many education systems around the world. The bell curve. Only a certain number of kids can get an A. Absolutely. Why can't they all get an A if they do well enough? I wish I could get an A. Greg, thank you so much for joining me on the program, matey. I'll see you again soon. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, and of course, thank you to all of you for tuning in. A thought-provoking show today presented by the team at Inquiry Tracker. If you'd like to learn more about how your school can use this amazing admission software, please head over to inquirytracker.net. I've been your host, Mike Loder, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Be well. <laughs>